everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every Wednesday, photographers meet here to connect, inspire, and create. Tonight is our 150th session, and I'm grateful that so many of you join me every week. This project began as a way to kill time while under COVID house arrest, but it has become a great community of photographers who are sharing what they know, creating great photographs, and more importantly, a place where we can all connect. I want to especially thank everyone that takes the time to help me promote the program by just sharing the link with other photographers in your social media posts or just mentioning it at your local camera clubs. You can find the schedule for our upcoming presentations on my website at lindanickel.com. And if you haven't already subscribed to the Happiness Hour YouTube channel, please do so so that you don't miss any of the sessions. Tonight's guest is Jennifer Lee Warner. Jennifer is a wildlife, nature, and conservation photographer based in Central Texas. Her photographs have appeared in publications such as Outdoor Photographer Magazine, The New Yorker, and Wild Planet Photo Magazine, and that's just to name a few. She is the current chair of the Ethics Committee for North America National Photography Association. A lot of people call that NAMPA. She's a Texas master naturalist and a mentor for the nonprofit uh, organization called Girls Who Click, in addition to leading photography workshops all over the world. In tonight's presentation, Beyond the Snapshot, curating a portfolio. During this discussion, Jennifer's going to show how she makes photographs that are worthy of hanging on the wall. If you're on Instagram, look for her at Experience Wildlife and on her website at experiencewildlife.com. Welcome back to the Happiness Hour, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here again. I can't Yay. believe you had me back again. Oh, um, I'll be back. As, you know, if you don't say no to me, I will take full advantage. And if you do say no, I'll break you down until you say yes, because that's <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm well, I'm glad to be here and I, I will come back anytime you ask. So um, let's share my screen here. And um, yeah, so we'll, as you said, we're going to be talking about curating a portfolio. And um, yeah, so I'm Jennifer Lee Warner. Um, this image I have to say was taken by um, a friend of mine that uh, many of you may know, David, David Valdez, um, have to give him a little photo credit because I love this this picture he took of me at um, at an art show I did in Georgetown. Um, but yeah, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, creating images, how I, will I create them, what is my kind of thought process um, through that. Um, I am also an ambassador for an organization called Nature First, which is an alliance for responsible nature photography. And it is between the NAMPA Ethics Committee and this. It's really all about creating images that are ethically sourced and, you know, making sure that we're not doing any harm when we're creating images. And that was what my first presentation was for the happiness hour. But wanted to share some of the other side of what I do, which is creating fine art images, images that end up in museums, galleries, public buildings, homes, um, things like that. And I'm going to give you a little introduction of who I am, how I got started, um, what people are typically looking for when I'm um, when I'm creating images and how I think about that when I'm creating images. Um, talk a little bit about how I compose them and then also where I put them in the end. Um, so Linda gave me a really good introduction, but I'll just kind of recap a little bit. I've been a full-time photographer for about 18 years, started the um, company Experience Wildlife back in 2006, and I travel all over the world for my photography. I've been very, very blessed to, to go to so many locations to create the images that I make. Um, I've been in museums and 
art galleries. I've had my images in um, convention centers and city halls. And I've been in art festivals and bazaars and things like that all over the country. Um, And I also do lead tours and workshops, both online and in person. And I just love teaching people how they can create images that they're happy with putting on their walls as well. But the image that I wanted to get right from the very start was this one. I loved cheetahs growing up. I was a big cat fanatic and I learned at a very early age that these animals were endangered and that made me very sad. And I wanted to do something that would help them as a species. And I found photography and I realized it was a really powerful tool to be able to get other people to care and other people to love um, this animal. The thing that everybody knows about cheetahs is they're the fastest land mammal on earth. So capturing the speed in an image, but getting people to see not just the speed, but the beauty of the animal. And I was lucky enough to be able to get this last year Um, after all of these years of photographing, to be able to capture the image that I was absolutely looking for. The blurred background, the sharp cheetah. um, And this is a captive animal. I will say this is an animal that was born in the wild, rescued at three days old from the illegal pet trade. And I'm really passionate about working with organizations that are helping um, save this species. So he works as an ambassador for his species. And um, this was captured in Namibia at the Cheetah Conservation Fund. Um, But like I said, I wanted to be able to share my images with as many people as possible. So putting them in places like convention centers, this is outside the Minneapolis Convention Center in Minnesota, and in art shows, um, being part of these showcases, uh, the raw um, artist community, I've done several shows all over the country with them. Even small venues like coffee shops and being in galleries, being featured artists in galleries and in um, in the Professional Photographers of America being part of their showcase. Of course, art festivals and um, gallery um, shows where I'm showcasing um, one image in a variety of different um, artists that are being represented. Um, And... That's how I really have been able to show my work to the world um, through these art exhibits. But I got started by working at a gallery of another individual. Um, I knew I wanted to be a photographer. I didn't really understand how to do it right from the start. So after I graduated college, I started working in an art gallery for Tom Mangelson. Um, He's considered one of the best wildlife photographers of his time. And he had 19 galleries at the time that I worked for him. I think he has like maybe five now. He's starting to get into that retirement age and um, paring down. But I was lucky enough to get to learn the art, um, the business of art, selling art from him. Um, And so I was the assistant manager at his gallery in Kirkland. And I learned not only what people were looking for, but also how to display the art as well as um, really understanding what it was that I was selling, that it wasn't just beautiful pictures, but you're you're telling a story, you're, you're selling um, these places to people that they may never be able to get to or somewhere that they're really passionate about and want a beautiful image of that place to, to remember um, the, you know, the wonderful times they had in that location. I also realized that in addition to learning from from the best, I wanted to network with the best. So I made it a mission to meet as many of my heroes as possible. People like Amy Vitale from National Geographic and Franz Lanting, Art Wolf, um, Steve Winter, uh, Wyland, not only photographers, but painters as well. Um, Tom Mangelson, Susie Esterhaas. Um, Melissa grew. And of course, my local photographers, um, this was at the Georgetown Photography Festival last year, and I was lucky enough to be a featured photographer there and networking with as many people as possible. And that was really important for me to learn from people that were sharing my passion. But what I would recommend to anyone and what I did was start local understand what is in your backyard and really get to know what is around you. 
being able to go back to places over and over and having a very good idea of what is happening as the seasons change and as time changes is going to be able to create images that are going to be more impactful. Um, this image was actually part of a book series that I was lucky enough to be part of at the very beginning of my career. Um, it's a Japanese maple leaf in um, the Washington State Arboretum in Seattle. Um, I also took this image. This image has been also in another book about um, migrating wildlife. And this was taken, not only was it in my backyard, but I was literally sitting in my living room when I took it. I had the back door open and I was photographing this duck in the pond that was in my backyard. Um, so really being able to capture what is local to you and that is going to really help you um, create really meaningful images if you can go back over and over and over. I spent a lot of my formative years in this park here. This is Bonita Bay in Kirkland, Washington. I would go there every morning before work, every evening after work. And I did that for several years, going back at least twice a day, every day and spending my days off in that park. I got to know the wildlife that was there, um, the both the you know birds, the reptiles, the amphibians, um, birds that were coming and going throughout the year, um, and being able to capture them in a way that somebody coming through once may have missed, being able to see these animals in their environment. I also sought out places that were very commonly photographed, um, this being Multnomah Falls. It wasn't very far from my house, only about a three-hour drive, and I went there every chance that I got, capturing it in different times of year. Um, I do believe um, that you should seek out those postcard pictures. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, that's been done. Don't do it. No, do it. Understand what it is that everybody is looking for and then make it your own. So taking that iconic landscape and finding different ways to capture it, learn how to create something that hasn't been done by something that is commonly photographed. So looking at this is all Multnomah Falls. This is the exact same waterfall, but seeing it either using a zoom lens, backing up and capturing the leaves in there or hiking up to the top and photographing it from a different angle. This is how you are able to create a portfolio of work by having unique images that you are able to really work over and over. Now, my passion did start in Africa. I wanted to go and photograph cheetahs, but that included the rest of um, the African wildlife. So I did make a point to go to Africa and I go as often as I can um, because it is what I'm passionate about. And I think that's really important that you find what you're passionate about because your work is going to be so much better if you really truly care about the images that you're making. So not just the animals, but the landscape in Africa as well, this acacia tree in the Masai Mara at sunset. And of course, those iconic animals like the giraffe. I also, as I started to really get a good handle on how to photograph what it was I wanted, I stretched the limits of what I knew and started creating images that were very unique. This um, being the lunar eclipse um, in Santa Cruz, not just what I saw, but how I wanted to show people the vision in my mind. So not just a literal version of what, what I saw, not just documentary, but to display an idea of an artistic intent of how I wanted to show people this moment. Of course, the moon only appears once in the sky and actually doesn't cross the sky, but to show the eclipse this way um, was certainly a unique perspective and is definitely one of my most sought after photographs. And showing it in a different way, this is actually a different lunar eclipse, but showing it in a way that is unique and gets people to start looking at an image, not just scrolling through. So what do people want? Well, typically they want to be told a story through your photographs. So finding images of um, that are going to be meaningful, that are going to get people to evoke emotion. So things like this, this image also being one that has been in incredibly popular over the years. Um, this mom, sea lion and her pup, and this tender moment they're having, not just the moment, but look how she matches the background and being really intentional in the angles and the color 
uh, combination that I'm creating with these images. Showing a very commonly photographed animal like a grizzly bear, but in a way that maybe is different than what other people are. I wanted to show people that these bears are not just bloodthirsty monsters, but they're mothers, they're, you know, they're siblings, they have these lives and to show the mom playing with her cub really strikes this emotion. Of course, the flowers being blurred out in the background, almost like a painting kind of softens the image as well. And then another very commonly photographed animal, but in a way that is so unique, it really starts to get you to think about this family moment as these great blue herons are the fathers coming in to feed the chicks. And you can see that the siblings are actually different sizes. It starts to get you to ask more questions, wanting to know more and more about these animals. I just took this picture um, a couple of days ago. I had to sneak it into this presentation because I loved the detail of not only the mom feeding the chicks, but just the the way that she's so tenderly, um, you know, got her beak down into the nest and the one's got, uh, one has his bill around her, um, her beak there. Such a cute little family. And not just showing animals together, but their individual personalities, also the, you know, showing them in their environment, like this pine marten dashing through the snow and the snow flying up. I do love animals together, though, and um, oftentimes it's moms and babies, but anytime that you can get two animals interacting is is really telling you more about the animal than just an individual picture of an animal doing something. Um, these least chipmunks in Grand Teton having this sweet little moment. I love the hands on, um, that's the male. I think he's kissing. Some people say he's biting, but it was a tender moment after some um, romancing <laughs> um, as he's kind of got his mouth on her, kind of giving her a little smooch. And another commonly seen animal, but not in a way that you typically see them. Um, this really giving you this sneak peek into the world of this rat as he's peeking through the fence to see if I'm catching him grabbing some bird feed. Uh, this was a um, a finalist in Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Didn't win, but certainly grabbed the judge's attention on um, that unique moment that I captured just in my backyard. Again, you don't have to travel all over the world to capture images that evoke emotion. You just have to be paying attention. People love portraits, though. If you're going to be hanging an image in a house, portraits are the number one thing that I sell. Um, and making sure that you're not just taking, you know, a, a snapshot of an animal, but that you are capturing the essence of them. And it's really all about the eyes. This red fox that I got in Colorado, um, yes, intentionally chopping off the tip of the ear to get this um, close up of the fox and just deep into her eyes as she's staring back at me this bison as well, um, the snow covering up the bottom of his feet, but leaving room for those um, imaginary legs, I like to call them, um, but getting him straight on looking directly into the, ca uh, into the camera, uh, definitely a portrait of this bison. And even this, um, uh, this black back jackal I got in Namibia, I was laying in the sand dunes. And of course, intentionally blowing out the background so that I could capture all the detail in his fur and really, again, having this moment where we're looking into each other's eyes. This one being done in a studio, again, a captive animal, an ambassador for her species. Um, this was from the San Diego Zoo um, Safari Park. They loaned this cheetah out for a charity event to raise money for the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And I was lucky enough to be able to put this cheetah on a studio background. Um, again, it's all about the eyes, making sure that those eyes are sharp and that it's evoking emotion. Don't forget the landscapes as well. Um, landscapes are also incredibly popular for anyone who wants to hang something in their house or a museum. But again, not taking just snapshots, but really capturing shadows and light and how the landscape plays with the the, the lines, things like that, this being in Sosa's Flay in Namibia, the um the red sand dunes with those dead trees. 
And of course, putting animals in our landscapes too, um, utilizing the environment to tell an environmental story about the animal and its habitat. Same location, totally different scene. Um, instead of the moose now, we've got the rainbow being the star of the show, but looking for those moments and going back over and over and over to capture you know, one area in different settings. And people want to feel connected. Um, people want to recognize a place, whether they've been there or they've always wanted to go there. So this being Texas, people love their blue bonnets. So making sure that you're capturing those places that they remember. Of course, our red poppies in Georgetown. And again, evoking these memories that people want to capture and hang in their house. And of course, our very popular birds, things like northern cardinals. Um, people have different emotions with northern cardinals. Some people just remember them coming to their bird feeder a lot. Some people um, have a belief that this is a uh, passed on ancestor coming to visit them. And whatever the reason for loving them, having these local birds is something that really speaks to people. Of course, our our um, our hummingbirds. You know, having these um, these birds that people want to draw into their yards and want to see on a regular basis, and capturing them in a way that is again evoking memories. And then sometimes people want to be taken to exotic locations, places they'll probably never get to go to, and um, being transported there. So places like the Galapagos Islands and capturing animals or places that people have always wanted to see. Of course, our very common locations as well. Um, like I said, it's okay to go to places that people have been many, many times, but capture in a way that's you know going to be unique to you. And of course, our exotic animals like Bengal tigers. I mean, how many people have actually gotten to go to India and see Bengal tigers in the wild? And, you know, not that many in retrospect. So capturing images that are going to transport pl people to places they may never get to go. Okay, so composition. So just talking a little bit about what it is you're looking for in an image. Of course, our rule of thirds, um, our leading lines, and thinking about where your eye is being drawn to. So this elephant I photographed in Kenya, I wanted to zoom in and get all of the details in her um, on her face. And because your eye is always going to be drawn to the lightest part of the portrait, your eye is automatically drawn to the white speck in her eye. Um, it almost looks like she's crying. Um, I've seen people literally burst into tears over this image um, just because of the, the wrinkles. It makes you think of, you know, someone who's elderly maybe, or, um, just a sad moment or a happy moment, but that just brings a lot of emotion when you can really just take out every other distracting element and just focus really in on the animal or utilizing multiple animals to be able to play with the lines. This being a very abstract image of several um, zebras that were kind enough to line up for me while I was in Atosha in Namibia with the baby being in front. And of course, using those um, rule of thirds by putting the the baby in that corner there. And then playing with different elements, like totally washing out the background here. I turned this image into black and white. I didn't have to do much because it's a black and white animal, but it really pulls out those black stripes by washing everything else out. And utilizing even the um, really low light by taking this cheetah that was almost in the dark. The sun was just rising. The colors are natural. This was the colors that were happening. And uh, just absolutely blessed with seeing this cheetah. Um, this is a wild cheetah in Namibia, um, taking a drink of water and reflecting in that, um, that pool of water. And leading lines, following that long neck of the giraffe up to its mother. And again, having that connection, that emotion of that mom child relationship. I also play with um, seeing an animal in an unexpected place. So I have a series of images that I like to say animals on vacation. This is a Greek cat in the ruins um, in Greece. And you typically can see this, but it's just kind of an unexpected thing to see a, a cat 
in a bunch of ruins. Same thing with this gray squirrel in um, Washington, D.C. with the Washington Monument. Just kind of looks like he's taking his tourist photo, but just something a little unexpected. And this ground squirrel as well, just laying on the ground and letting him line himself up with this barn and Grand Teton. And even playing with other animals as frames. So capturing these ranch horses and Grand Teton using the, the mountains in the background and this one horse in the foreground. Um, to be able to create this, um, almost the sandwich effect for the horses in the middle. So where do I display? Um, I put my images anywhere that I can, I can possibly get them in front of eyes. So I sell them online, um, farmer's markets, street markets, fairs, bazaars, art festivals, and galleries and museums and public buildings, um, looking for showcases, um, things like that. But when I do it, I don't do it randomly. Um, I'm definitely trying to create some sort of theme. So it might be of a place, it might be of a subject, but trying to have some sort of cohesive element to my shows. Um, and then designing those shows with flow in mind that it's kind of like reading a book that you're telling a story as they're looking through the images. Um, and making sure that you're creating tags. I so often see images up with no description and I want to learn more. It should get me to start asking questions. And that's what the description's for is to start answering some of those questions. So just kind of an idea of what a display might look like, this being a story about Yellowstone. So utilizing different sizes and um, including some landscape in with the different wildlife that you might find in Yellowstone or Africa, showcasing the different animals, but again, utilizing vertical versus horizontal to tell the different animals that might appear um, in one location. And then when I'm placing the images, I'm thinking about um, what feels natural. I wouldn't put an animal that's in a tree and an animal that's on the ground with the one that's in the tree below the one that's on the ground. It makes you feel like you're upside down. So making sure that you're curating your display in a way that naturally makes sense. Same thing with animals that are in the sky versus showing things that are on the ground. So a bird should always appear above a landscape. But just remember that whatever it is you're creating, that you're going back to what you're passionate about, what you care about, because if you care about the subject, it's going to be a much better photo and you're going to get people to care more about the images that you're making. So this being my my favorite boy back at the cheetah conservation fund, this was the same image, um, same cheetah from the one that was running just four years earlier. I go back and visit him as much as I can. Um, so quick plug before um, I answer any questions, I do lead workshops, um, as Linda said, um, and I'd love to take you out um, into the field. I have some tours this year, Grand Teton Fall and Spring, um, as well as the Best of Washington State. And then next year, um, I'm still adding tours, but we've got tons of tours happening in 2024. Um, and I'm just going to pop my socials um, up here. So you can always ask me questions. If you think of something later, um, feel free to contact me. Um, and that being said, open up to any questions. Yeah. Okay. So let me um, give people just a minute <clears throat> to take a screenshot of that, but it'll also be on the YouTube channel. Okay. I'm going to get you to take that down. Yep. Um, anybody? I, I was kind of like, there's a lot of comments in here. There are a lot of nice comments in here, um, which, you know, I don't expect anything less than nice comments because this is such a really nice group of people. But I don't see any questions in here. So anybody? I'm going to give you a second. There's a lot of slow typists in here, I think. Okay. Oh, all right. Mark Goldman's going to get one in here. So Mark says, or is asking, what's the best way to display the photos? You're doing, yeah. marks, you're doing walls. What is your, what's your setup? Yeah. So a little bit will depend on the venue. So if it's a gallery, a museum, I'm almost always framing the work. Um, that's something that in a more permanent setting, um, people like there's a level of expectation when you're in a museum or a gallery that they should look 
um, more traditional. Mm -hmm. When I am doing something like a street fair, a bazaar, I put them on metal um, because it's one, it looks really clean. It's very vibrant. And frankly, it's very easy to transport. Um, if I do framed and glass and I do shows like that, I break more than I sell and I tend to do. So, um, I like to add variety, but, um, it really does kind of depend. Um, if I'm traveling to a show, sometimes I use things called, um, exposers, which are something you can get a Bay photo. They, um, bayphoto.com and it's something that can roll up so I can transport it, but I don't do it very often. Um, but I do love the metals and I do also always offer prints um, because not everybody has room on their wall or wants it displayed a certain way. So giving that variety of having some pictures that are hanging up and then some prints that are available um, is always really successful for me. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. All of a sudden the, the question started flooding. Um I think you mentioned Bay Photo, but Karina's got two questions. Do you have a preferred printer or a place that you, that you use for your photos? Yeah, I love Bay Photo. Um, they have done such a good job, particularly with the metal printing. Um, but I've been very happy with everything they've done. Um, I've had a few mistakes over the years and they fix them immediately. No questions asked. Um, so that I think customer service is just as important as quality. And I would say that they it's equally matched. They're very good. Okay. Um, Karina has that second question. What do you use to create a portfolio? What do I use to create a portfolio? I'm yeah. not sure. Are you, totally are you understanding the maybe I am Karina, maybe you can explain. Um, I was wondering if maybe she's asking if you use a software to help you um gather your groups of yeah. Yeah. um yeah, I mean Lightroom helps me categorize things a little bit. Um I I do have a website and then I I do lump them into either projects or subject matter location, things like that. Um, and I use um Squarespace for my um for my portfolio online. Okay. Um Camille's question is what was your overall impression of the raw artists showcases? Um did you enjoy participating in those? Yeah, I'm gonna be really, really honest. They're weird. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> They're, they're, they're weird. Um, I've, I've done about five of them and every location has their kind of own feel. Um, San Francisco, I would never do again. It was very strange, but, um, Denver was great. I loved Denver. Um, but yeah, so basically if you're not familiar with them, you get one night there are all sorts of artists. There are performers, there's singers, there's, um, 2D artists, there's 3D artists, I mean, there's all sorts of different artists in one location, and everybody sells tickets and invites whoever, and you just get a variety of different people appreciating the art, so it's it's really fun, but you get some pretty weird stuff in there, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that, it's kind of <laughs> weird, but it's fun. Um, Donna's curious. Um, she wants to know if you can talk about um, editing for print versus just viewing on your computer screen. Um, for example, her images have a tendency to print a little darker than what she's seeing on her screen. Yeah. You want to make sure that you're calibrating your screen, first of all. That's really, really important. Um, and I also think that if you can get a printer, like, I mean, m most reputable printers will do this. It'll give you sample prints. It'll give you an idea on if it's coming out the way you expect them to. Um, so, you know, if it, if it's coming out too dark or it's coming out too light, you know, work with your printer, let them know that it's not as you're seeing them. And maybe they can help you with making sure your screen is calibrated properly. And I'm going to slip in a little plug for later this summer, um, Donna. Um, on August 23rd, I've asked one of um, the, my local printer to come and do a presentation for us specifically to answer questions um, that, you know, what you see on your screen, what does a printer need from us um, to do what they need to, to do 
to create, or to print the images so that we'll be happy with them. So um, hopefully this summer um, you can make that presentation. Um, <clears throat> Darlene says, oh, your wildlife images are wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Um, Kevin, his question is, or he says, it looks like you, you work over a wide range of focal lengths. Do you have a favorite or a favorite range? You know, it just kind of depends on what I'm photographing. Um, I, I use my telephoto a lot because, um, as I mentioned with ethics, I want to make sure I'm not disturbing the wildlife. Um, you could see the ones that my animals on vacation are more wide angle. Um, and that has a lot to do with habituation. Um, those animals are clearly in places that they're habituated. Not that I'm doing anything particularly, they just happen to be there, but these are animals that are used to people. Um, and so you can get a little bit more wide angle, which is really fun if you can get a wide angle portrait of an animal, but I wouldn't recommend doing it unless the animal is pretty used to people. Um, so yeah, I mean, I use my, my, common lenses I use is the Nikon 200 to 500 and the um, Nikon 24 to 70. Okay. Um, Beth says, love your work. Wondered if you also incorporate a painterly or fine art look in your portfolio. Um, she's saying, I'm thinking in terms of textures, impressionism, et cetera. Um, thanks for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Sometimes um, you can see like with the the one of the zebras is a little more abstract. Um, you know, it's always fun to play with um, particularly landscapes, adding some painterly effects to it in camera. I don't do a lot of post-process manipulation when it comes to adding that kind of elements, but I mean, finding your own style and I've seen some that are absolutely extraordinary, but you know, you play a little bit um but a lot of mine are a little more of a documentary style it's just kind of the style I've adapted but starting to add really fun elements with um particularly when it comes to like leading lines and and things like that yeah um Karina was um when she was asking about um how you create your portfolio she was talking about software I think your answer was Lightroom is what you use to yeah. kind of create um, do you have uh, any tips on how you um, maybe mark up your photos um, in Lightroom, how you rank them or mm -hmm. anything that you can maybe offer a tip? Yeah. To help yeah. Um, I typically, once I, I get out of the field, I, I, I try not to do anything in the field. Um, you're a little bit too in the moment, um, which unless you have to pull an image because you're on some sort of assignment, it's best to let it sit for a little bit. Um, so I wait until I get back and I will kind of just breeze through the images and pull out a couple like really, like I knew right in the moment that that was an image I wanted to keep. And then I might let it sit a little longer. Um, and then when I have a little bit of time, um, I go through all of them and they either get a ranking of two or nothing. Um, and then once I have all my twos and two really doesn't mean anything, it could be four. It's just the number I chose. Um, I take all my twos and then I go through and I start editing. And once I've edited it, then I flag it. Um, and anything that doesn't at least get a two ranking, um, ends up in some kind of back storage and everything else kind of just sits there. And, um, you got to make sure that you're, um, adding metadata though, so that you're, including at least the species, the location, um, and any other pertinent and detailed information. And that'll help you be able to pull those images. Um, okay, last call for questions, but Carolyn says she has so many of them. So she's just gonna reach out to you um, separately. But she, her question is, are you like located in Washington? The answer is no, but she used to, she's from Washington. So she's um, probably going to look into your Washington tour later this year. Um, all right. Last call. I think, wait a minute. Uh, some nice thank yous, but I don't see any other questions. So let me thank you, Jennifer. Um, so what you guys may not realize is that she just got back last night from 
um, uh, workshops. And she's, I think, leaving in a couple of days for another one. So she's, when we were talking about um, having her come back, it's like, okay, we got to figure out how we can um, work a schedule <laughs> that she wasn't on the road. And I appreciate um, that you we did this like months and months ago to get you in here. So thank you for doing it. And I know it takes a little bit of uh, time to put in, put a presentation together and it was beautiful. And I, I appreciate the work that you did for us. Um, all right. As a reminder, you can connect with Jennifer through her website, experiencewildlife.com. And you can find her on Instagram at experience wildlife next week. Flower photographer Lucy Ketchum will join us with her presentation, A Close-Up Approach to Flower Photography. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful, and I hope that we see you again soon.